community development, and reconciliation to God, to self, and to others. Now, our speaker, we got two speakers, but I'm talking about my dad, my high speaker. <laughs> he has a rich, progressive heritage in serving the poor. When you hear my dad talk uh, or read his books, what you may not know is during that journey, we followed our parents wherever in all these places of need. We first started in Hall in 1960, and which was a place of need. We moved to, uh, to Jackson, another place. Um, then he had the nerve to take us to uh, Northwest Pasadena, where it had the high state at the time crime rate, and we followed him there. And now we're back in Jackson, and Jackson, the area that we live in is about. I would say about a mile from the governor's mansion, half a mile just from downtown in general. But our families, the people who we work with, um, they feel this start. And, and we are there because we want to make sure that we bring some kind of hope to that community and to those families. We have a, a, a youth program, we have a summer camp, we have all these things going on. But I think one of the biggest things that we uh, do is our relationships with our parents, with our kids, with the people in our community. Um, we want you to uh, visit us. I want you to come down and visit our, our forgotten neighborhood where uh, we have, I, I don't know what y'all, I feel like every, my whole life, I have lived in the forgotten neighborhood. <laughs> and, and I was telling Lisa this morning, I know in here, this is where I'm supposed to be. Daddy was asking me, we were talking about the future, future, future. And I said to him, if everything around me is changing, I know in here that God has placed me in West Jackson for the rest of my life. And so what I want to do is invite y'all spread this word Lily. Lily, <laughs> we want you all to bring a team down. You know, we want uh, churches, colleges, anyone who is interested in, let me just say this, anyone who is interested us loving on y'all. That's what we do. That's what that's what we do in our in, in our in our little uh, corner of, of uh, Northwest Pasadena. We want to love on y'all, and we want y'all to just come visit. And anyone who uh, our website is uh, jvmpf j as in John b as in beer mpf dot org. If you need more information, I'll be available after. Uh, after the service, but y'all come see us. Some, a lot, my daddy said people like an invitation. This is your invitation. <laughs> this is your invitation. So come see us, and we, I hope to see y'all. Y'all might want to come during the summer, but you might want to come. <laughs> oh, wait, let me tell you, to, about, to, the people who, the, to the people who are graduating, if you want to get a good experience, and um, you need to come visit us. We can, uh, well, just come visit us. <laughs>
founding president of the John and Vera May Perkins Foundation, co-founder of the Christian Community Development Association, and the founding visionary of the John Perkins Center here at SPU. He has authored more than a dozen books, including his most recent book, One Blood, Parting Words from the Church on Race and Love, and has received several honorary doc doctorates from universities across the nation, including Seattle Pacific. He is here with us alongside his daughters, Elizabeth Perkins and Priscilla Perkins, who in 2016 were appointed co-presidents of the Foundation in Jackson. Just this month, Dr. Perkins was awarded the Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Reformed Theology and Public Life. And so it is always an honor to have Dr. Perkins here with us. pleasure to be here. I grew up in Seattle. Alderwood Mall was my mall. It's a real happening place in the 80s. Um, it's an honor to be here with Dr. Perkins. I first heard Dr. Perkins speak in the summer of 95 at Harambe and uh, have been a part of CCDA and its conferences for many years, so I really appreciate the chance to be here. Time is limited, so that's all the friendliness. Now we go. Are we ready? All right. Um, we're talking about words having power. And because words have power, we need to be thinking about who is framing our theology and who is giving us our theological words. Who's defining what is sin? Who is defining what is justice? Who is framing that? So not only are we trying to move towards those things, but have we examined who is giving us the language that is framing that journey? To kick us off, I want to jump into Luke chapter 1. I like to picture the Bible, so I want you to visualize it with me. This is often an Advent scripture, but it is really a foundational scripture for me. Luke often uh, compares two people having a similar experience with different responses. And, you know, so you have two people going up to pray or two sons with the same father. And in this instance, you have two people with an angelic visitation and some news about a baby. So the first person we see is Zechariah. Now you got a picture, there's been uh, a, a long period of waiting. And then we open up on the temple in Jerusalem. All right, and you gotta think this is pre-internet, pre-electricity, pre-everyone travels everywhere. So the temple is a spectacle, like the light hits it and it just shines and you can see it for miles around. So when something starts happening at the temple, you can feel like the, in the audience, you're like, yes, 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 good things happen there, God's there, I'm ready. And then the camera pans in and the people are coming in for worship and you'd be like, yes, worship, temple, ready. And then it's Zechariah. Now, Zechariah's having a day as a priest, all right? Because at that time, there was like 8,000 different priests. There was 24 divisions. There was 300 priests in each division. Each division served for two weeks a year. 56 priests participated a day. There were two services a day. They would draw lots. And if you drew lots, you only got to do it once. And Zechariah had drawn the lot that day, which meant he was going to get to go even deeper into the temple, light the incense, while the people of God are praying outside. So you feel like going deeper inside to the incense place. It's on, right? <laughs> then the mu right, this is where the music picks up, all right? The intensity is coming. Suddenly, an angel appears. It's 
on, right? You just feel it. Angels too, not a baby fat angel, like a powerful angel, all right? People are scared of angels in scripture, so don't picture just a little fat white baby. Picture something powerful and authoritative showing up. So you can feel like all this waiting, all this silence, and now an angel has shown up. So Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. You are going to have this child you've been waiting for forever. And you're like, yes, it's on. Old people waiting for babies is such an us thing. You can feel the audience saying, God's doing it. And then Zechariah has the wrong response. His response is not one of faith and trust. And so then this angel steps up and starts talking just a skadoosh trash, which you can just feel it like the angel, you know, Zechariah's like, mm, I don't think that's going to happen. And the angel's like, oh, you must not know where I recently came from. It's the presence of the living God. Also, my name, Gabriel. You, you're going to stop talking now for the next nine months because your mouth is talking crazy. <laughs> now, if this is like the needle off the record. Like we waited hundreds of years for this unfaithful response. <laughs> like what's happening? So now the camera's panning back and we're gonna leave the temple. And we're gonna leave Jerusalem. And we're gonna leave past that first suburb where there's like, it's still like, you know, people still think it's Seattle. And then we're gonna go even further out to that suburb that you only stop at for gas and a burger before you're really getting into Podunk, Washington. And then you're gonna go even further to that town that's super obscure and you feel like everybody's homeschooled there. And you're gonna go even <laughs> further to like a town nobody's ever heard of. And in that town is like a 13 year old illiterate girl living an anonymous life. And she is destined to live the life of just about every other no-name girl of her time. She's going to live, get married, have multiple children, probably lose some of them, not travel far from the city she was, um, grew up in, and die anonymously. Now, she also gets an angelic appearance that says, you have been chosen to partner with the living God in one of the most intimate ways that you can partner bringing his child into this world. And even though she has some questions about how that's gonna work, the angel doesn't see it as the same kind of questioning response as Zechariah. And her response is, may it be to me according to your word. Amazing. This opening snapshot in Luke lets us know that the people with the religious decree, degrees, the people with the role, the people at the title, the people in the institution, the people that you think are gonna be the models of faithfulness, the people that you think are gonna give you all the theology you need to be orthodox, those people are not the ones that are gonna lead the way into this revolutionary new kingdom. Those people will be taking a seat for a moment. Instead, this one, over here, written off, discarded, at the margins of society in every way, it is her understanding of what has happened to herself. Because she picks up, goes to Elizabeth's house, and you gotta think, Elizabeth's house, right? Elizabeth is married to Zechariah. Elizabeth's house is real quiet lately because Zechariah is in silence. <laughs> and it says, when Mary shows up, Elizabeth doesn't go, mm, my husband's struggling, so I must sit silently by it. So she greets Mary with a loud voice. And this old pregnant lady and this young, knocked up teenage girl, exegete and create theology off of the coming birth of Jesus. And people try to write off what Mary does by calling it like a cute little poem and saying it's a Magnificat and singing weird songs like Mary Do You Know? Girl knows, all right? For sure a dude wrote that song. She knows. And she lays out in the Magnificat what is the theological foundation of the book of Luke. He's shown strength with his arm. He scatters the proud. He's brought down the powerful, filled the hungry with good things, sent the rich away empty, and helped his servant Israel. She takes what is happening to her body and her experience with God. She exegetes it into theology. She exegetes her experience, her lived experience, into a theological framework that later Jesus jumps off on. John the Baptist jumps off on it. Jesus talks about it, Luke 4, the Sermon on the Plain, that whole framework, though, is launched off by Mary. And so what I see here is that we need to be paying attention to theology shaped by those from the margins. 
Now, this is different. This is how often, when you're in Christian spaces, when we talk about theology from the margins, it's like a Christmas tree. And the Christmas tree is white male theology. And theology by anyone else is like cute decorative theology. Like, this is the main thing. That's nice, ladies. It's good for you, black liberation theologians. That's nice, mujerista theology. But the main thing, the thing that gets called theology is always still shaped by white men. But that is not what we are invited to do if I look at Luke 1. Theology is supposed to be shaped by those on the margins. So when black folks exegete the policing of their bodies and state-sanctioned violence, it isn't political, it's theological. And when dreamers come out of the shadows and ask for dignity for their experience, it's not illegal, it's theological. And when poor folks say they need to be paid more in order to have housing while working for companies where CEOs get paid 350% more than their average employee, it's not socialism, it's theological. And when queer folks ask for more than just being tolerated in a space, it's not identity politics, it's theological. And I'm not just, I know you can listen to that and be like, oh, girl must be progressive. It's also not just about being labeled as progressive or conservative. Because frankly, conversations, conservative white Christianity and progressive white Christianity is still rooted in problematic whiteness. And so we need a theology that is more radical than either end of a whiteness anchored response to the injustices and things that we see in the world. We need to wrestle with the reality that theology that was shaped by privileged white heterosexual men is what energized and anchored the doctrine of discovery, which drove genocide on the land that we live in. And you need to understand, I'm not talking like individual, like I don't like white dudes. I married a white dude. I know white dudes, okay? We're talking systemic, institutional, larger systems. Cool? So come out of the fetal position. Okay. <laughs> White male theology, land-owning, privileged, capitalism-driven theology justified slavery, justified Jim Crow, justifies mass incarceration. So theology by those in power needs to be examined. And if it is those people who have been defining what sin is, sin is looking at porn, not mass incarceration. Violence is women in leadership. That's the terrible thing that's happening in the church. Right? The, who's defining what violence is? Who's defining what sin is? Who's defining the significance of what happened on the cross? Western theology is incredibly individualistic. So if you ask most people raised under Western theology, why did Jesus die on the cross? Jesus died for my sins. How individualistic is that? How, if you've indoctrinated people with an individualistic theology and an individualistic understanding of what happened on the cross, are you ever going to get free of institutions and systems of marginalization and oppression? Our theology is too reductionistic, and it's been shaped by those who are privileged. And I don't just say that because you'd be like, well, that's nice for you, girlfriend, woman of color. You would like that. I would like that. It is nice to be on the margin sometimes. But in other moments, I am privileged. Right? As a heterosexual woman, as a cisgender person, I'm very privileged in Christian spaces. So I need to be listening to those on the margins. When I'm in Christian spaces as a woman of color preacher, man, I can't even tell you how many Korean American pastors felt free to sit me down and tell me I was not a legitimate leader. I'm marginalized in those spaces. When I walk into a Christian space, I work at a predominantly black church. The pastor, the head pastor that I work with uh, is a black man. When we walk into spaces, people take him seriously as a Christian leader much faster than they take me seriously as a Christian leader. But when we walk out onto the sidewalk from that place, my, I'm positioned in privilege. When we walk by a policeman, I know where I'm positioned systemically. In any given moment, moment I might move from the center to the margins. And when I'm thinking about my theological understanding of different situations, the language that I'm using has to come from those who are most impacted by it. My master's comes from uh, the Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies. 
And when I walked into that program, I knew nothing about, like, very much about what was going on for Native American folks. And the first thing that happens when you go, when I went into that program, all the professors are Native American Christians, as are many of the students, is people introduce themselves, and they say their name, and they say their tribe, and where they're from, and then if you are non-Indigenous, you open with, hi, I'm Erna, I'm a settler. Because that is the language those who are most impacted by settler colonialism are asking me to use. And I don't go, but I didn't want to be a settler. I didn't even know settler colonialism was a thing. That's not. What I say is, you're most impacted by it. You have the best understanding of it. Systems that I am privileged by exist to make me blind to them. So I'm not an expert on them, and I need to be led by those who are most impacted by them. And not vice versa, systems that I am marginalized in, I understand better than those who are privileged by them. So people need to listen to me on them. And so I'm willing to use the language that they provide me. I'm going to close. But I want to challenge us and invite us to consider who is framing your theology? Who is framing your language? Are you anchored in language and theology that comes from those that are privileged by the system? And if you are, you need to reconsider that and understand you will never be able to dismantle a system with a theology created by those who benefit from it. And part of it is not trusting. Like, yeah, I, we, we would much rather hold on to a paternalistic interplay with those on the margins. But what happens with Mary is God isn't like, Zechariah, you do you and you just be nice to Mary. Zechariah has to be silent. And Mary goes from the margins all the way to the center. Amen? Amen. words um, for those challenges. Um, we want to just take a moment. Um, can I turn focus and we're going to try to have a conversation here. Um, Dr. Perkins, we'd love um, to engage in the next, the remaining time that we have in a conversation. I'll be asking some questions to both of you um, and hopefully we can we can dig into a little bit of something. We don't have a lot of time, but um, we do have some time. So uh, Dr. Perkins, though, let's start with you um, as kind of the birthing leader of what is kind of modern day reconciliation. Um, why um, and how have you used the word, the word reconciliation in the gospel? And how has that shaped what you've lived into, into what you see the current um, movement. Reconciliation is the, the most redemptive of the redemptiveness of the gospel. You gotta understand that. What is reconciliation? What is reconciliation? It seemed like we have rediscovered it in modern days. And so the problem might be we have lost the meaning and the motivation for reconciliation. It is the word. Uh, it comes out of the story of the incarnation when man sinned against God, he violated God by asking a question about God or what God has said. And that brought the world sin and death. And reconciliation was God's way of affirming his love and his justice and the dignity of humanity. Uh, we're going to hear him say that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself. The glory part of that, that he enlists you and me once we are reconciled to him as his helpers, as his reconcilers in the world. And so we bring the good news that God has come to reconcile us from us. That was the original good news to the shepherds. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto us is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The main problem is that we were broken in terms of our relationship to this one God. Reconciliation, the way we do it today, makes the wrong assumption. The wrong assumption that there is too many races. The Bible makes the assumption that there's one God, one mediator, and he made from one blood all the nation and the people to live upon earth. It's wrong-headed. And the motivation, what is the motivation of it? It's to establish love and justice, to bring us back to the way he made us, to make us one again. Now, we are dealing basically with the issues that come out of reconciliation, but God is reconciling all things unto himself, but he don't want to do it alone. He wants to reconcile us to himself, and then we become ministers of reconciliation. We are his ambassadors for Christ. So it's, the motivation is very wrong-headed, uh, and that's what one blood is trying to establish, that there is one human race, and that God has come that we might... You won't hit the mark. We're missing the mark and we're using all of our time working on the issues, the main issues that mankind is broken. Yeah. And he want to reconcile broken humanity and use that broken humanity as his ambassadors of reconciliation. So, Dr. Perkins, I hear you rooting um, reconciliation in the gospel and rooting it in this foundation of, um, of God who's seeing us and seeing us in our fullness and seeing us in our full dignity. However, um, Pastor Hackett, um, I think that you um, are speaking um, from, a, from a different lens and a lens that is, I, I feel like I often hear a lot of students questioning in terms of reconciliation and that question of like, has the work of reconciliation moved a little bit or that sense and need um, to use different language, but a, um, and a, even in, in reflection of your words to us today and talking about kind of white culture, um, I would you know, assume and, and know that um, from what Dr. Perkins is saying that in terms of God recognizing people's humanity, I don't know if white culture or white supremacy culture recognizes the dignity of everyone. Um, and so can you speak a little bit kind of to the language shift that you're seeing? Sure. Um, I feel like we're holding Dr. Perkins back by putting him in a chair. Did anyone else feel that? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Perkins, we made you sit down during this time. Um, yeah, I think that the, you know, who's getting to define the words, right? So, for example, I think there's a resistance among folks around the word reconciliation in 2019, not because there's a disagreement with the larger purpose or the movement towards justice, but feeling like the word reconciliation kind of got co-opted by whiteness and it got co-opted by an individualistic lens. So reconciliation, instead of feeling like it was moving towards justice, became, I want, you, I want to feel like you like me. So that whenever it was like, I'm, I'm trying to say that there's something problematic here in this system, and then white folks would do like, oh, you're making me feel bad. That means we're unreconciled. And it was like, stop. We're unreconciled because uh, this entire system is dehumanizing me. Whether that be people you know, experiencing police violence or whether that be in 2019 we had to pass a law so that black people could just wear their hair the way it grows out of their heads in the workplace. In 2019, we're still having to pass laws so that black folks can just be a black person, human, 
wearing their hair the way it grows out of their head in the workplace, the fact that we're making laws around that. That's the actual injustice. If you treat somebody bad, like let's say you execute a microaggression in the workplace against somebody because they're wearing their hair naturally and then they tell you that that's problematic and then you say you've made us unreconciled. What's the actual problem, right? The problem is this, dehumanizing action towards this black person in the workplace. But the co-opting of the reconciliation term has moved the problem over to white people feeling bad about the actual problem. So I think that it's that, uh, I think folks, the next generation millennials are calling out, we want to get there, but the term has lost its potency because now it's in the hands of the privileged. And so people want a more systemic and institutional language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you are on to something I think there's something go before that, that we are equally broken and we have made our own ideas about reconciliation. And we have missed the dignity of the humanity and the motivation for God's reconciliation and what the good news of the gospel is all about. We are broken evenly, white and black. We have, both have believed a lie by the devil and by society. One has made us believe that we are superior and the other one in our long history has made another feel inferior and have color-coded that. And has color-coded that. Uh, so, So I think what we are missing we are missing the inherited dignity. I, I, and I think God's suffering and his pain and the way he redeemed us is, is, is showing his deep love for humanity. And so the problem is we both have believed a lie. And we both, uh, and then we use it based upon our selfishness and advantage. We've used it, sin itself is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what affirmed Jesus as being God when he was here on earth. He resisted that. He resisted that. And so what we do is that we are sinners, and we broke, and we will find a way to dehumanize the other one. And the last dehumanization is killing each other. And, and, and the last dehumanization is genocide type of killing because that was the original killing in our life. So I think, I think that we are somewhat today, this generation is somewhat playing a game in society and that are coming back and affirming man's dignity. Uh, In the image of God created he them. And he kissed life into that clay. And we became a living soul, eco. We don't believe in equality anymore. We are so broken. We believe in ourself, in ourself. And part of our problem is our self-addiction. Some of our problem is that we are, we are calling God a lie. We are, we are questioning whose life matters. That's an insane asylum. That was never supposed to be questioned. That's a statement about God, and it's a statement about humanity. Until we come back and affirm our brokenness and the sign of our healing is that we are willing to enter into the pain of our broken sisters and brothers. That's our model. Jesus came and entered into our pain. And it's in that pain, it's in that suffering, come unto me, all of you that are broken, all of us, and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, I am meek, I'm lonely, I love you, I love you. 
And what we're doing is playing race games. And, and that's create. oh, it's, we don't fill it with hate now. This is a game. This is a game. I like your analysis and all that. I like that. But I, I, I'm, I'm looking for a, a growth in a solution that works. And when we find out that things are not working, we need to look at that more creatively in our life. I think that um, some of what um, Pastor Hackett is bringing um, in that voice is trying to put language to. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not fighting you. I'm coming back to the more original. But you asked me a question about the nature of reconciliation. Yes. See, you are helping me. You're talking about the broken parts. And, so, and I, I affirm that. I told you white folks think they're superior. The devil done fool them. And they had to put up a lot of sign and dehumanize black. We had to call them all of that. We had to niggerize them. What the pro... So if I give all of my time to that, I'm not going to be able to bring them the good news of God's redemptive love. And Jesus showed that. The gospel is not only a statement, but it's a demonstration. And he wants uh, a love is a demonstration. We got to be the solution. We got to be the... And so the church is the body of that solution. The church hooks us up as friends, and we walk together as friends in this broken world. We shine as light in the midst of a dark and broken world. He said, you are the light. You are deciding. You are helping us with a lot of these pieces and how we are broken. And you are telling us about how the world is looking at that. It's not working. It's not working, but, but, but you, you are helping us. You're helping us. I'm, you asked me what was reconciliation. I'm saying it is God's solution to man's dilemma. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Then Paul gets on his knees. He said, I beg you, I plead with you, don't take God's grace which is the solution, don't take it in vain. God has given us the solution in reconciliation. And that reconciliation is seen in our love for the broken people of society. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm talking about here a solution. This one is not working. If it's not the skinhead, it's going to be the next head. And it's going to be those who have the economic power because justice is how we steward solution to problem. Justice is how we manage the economy. Justice is how we deprive others from open access to the society. That's what the little Book of Ruth is about. It's about how you enfranchise people. And Ruth was enfranchised by Naomi's love, by her love yes. in our society. Love one another, for love is of God. He that loves is one. I'm talking about a solution yes. in terms of reconciliation. That's all. Yeah, and I think you've brought us to... Brought us to, and to the, the season that we're in, in terms of Easter and... Um, Pastor Erna, I would love for you to respond in our um, closing time. Um, just what is kind of the impact you see as far as kind of the risen Christ um, and reconciliation in this cause as we're addressing um, the reality of we're living in a system and we're living in a system of white culture? Yeah, I think uh, when I think about Easter, one of the things I've been thinking about in terms of expanding my understanding of what happens on the cross is Going back to, you know, every football team's favorite Bible verse, John 3.16, which is, for God so loved the world. And I think that we often collapse that into, for God so loved me. Mm -hmm. But if we really think, mm -hmm. it is because God so loved the world, and we really yeah. think about what is held in that, that is not just individuals, but like 
you know, all of cultures and all of peoples and all of systems and all of creation. Yes. All of creation, creation saints, like the world, like the earth, like nature. Um, when, it, when God looked at all of that in sending Jesus, then when I think about living in the Easter season, it's because God so loved not just an individuals, but God so loved all that's contained in that, that the cross is meant to bring redemption and reconciliation to all of that. Yes. And so I find that, um, I find that compelling. You know, I think that part of, I mean, you definitely need, we need an individual, like, you know, I was talking to somebody and they had an incredibly insightful and incisive systemic and institutionalized analysis, but real talk, they were a jerk. So you need an institutionalized and systemic analysis. You also need the ability to love radically, compassionately, and empathetically. And you need both. And I think that there's just a mutual put, like push. Those who come from this end of the spectrum, right? Cancel culture, call out culture. There does need to be a sense of like, if you go into cancel culture, if you accept the the underlying assumption that some people are disposable, we're not. We have to throw out the entire framework that people are disposable. If you're just changing who's disposable we haven't really moved towards justice. So if you have a strong institutional analysis, we need this push here. And if you come from a strong individualistic interpersonal analysis, you need to be pushed towards an institutional analysis so that we can get there to redemption, liberation, reconciliation, wholeness in Christ. And you're saying that the world is broken and he's reconciled, and you're saying it, he's working silent all things to himself. God is God, and he is a reconciler. And he's reconciling and redeeming he, all that is broken by sin. God reconciled it all. That, when you know God, you know God as the creator and the reconciler. And yes, man is broken. That's the first sign. The first sign is that he's broken. That's what begins to move you in terms of some energy and passion towards repentance so you can enter into that pain. And it becomes really, in the end, all of God and not of us. It's all of God. He is using us as agents as, that's the joy. The joy is that a holy God who wouldn't have to have us but loves us so much, he comes and redeems us and woos us into, by his love, into the pain that he bore and that we are to join him in that pain of redemption. Oh, you, you, Another sermon. <laughs> We're out of time, but as we close, as Chaplain Lisa comes up to close us, I'm just going to read two quotes that I think um, from Dr. Perkins' book uh, that helps us into the conversation we've had. And one of them says, "We have been intentional about building the walls that separate us." And it goes on, "We must be even more intentional." about tearing them down. And I think we heard a lot of good things from Pastor Hacken on that. Um, And then the last quote, when it's all said and done, love is a choice, it's a decision. And Dr. Perkins said, I choose the way of love. I've chosen to be marked by it.
And God, I'm so grateful for Pastor Erna's work and the ways that she is helping us to think through how do we live out this sanctification and growing place. God, this quarter we've been talking about the fruitful life, and in the fruitful life, there's the, the pruning back and living into places that are challenging at times, God, just as much as we remain and abide in you and grow fruit. Part of that is that pruning process. And so, God, I pray that as we get to continue to journey together, that you would continue to shape us. The ways that we think, the ways that we get to love people, the ways that we get to walk with one another. So, Holy Spirit, we pray for your work in us because we cannot do it on our own. And we trust that you are the one who is at work doing these things. And so, God, I'm so grateful. And we come back to that song that we sang earlier, Christ the Solid Rock. We stand. We stand together in you, Christ. So, God, I thank you for a place like this that we can have these conversations that are rooted and grounded we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to draw your attention to a couple of things tonight. We're going to continue. So if you want to hear more of this, we're going to be here at 7.30. And then also, if you were coming to Sharpen for the lunch, we're actually canceling it because we've had some facilities issues. Um, but if you are interested also in joining us for a service tomorrow night, the group will be joining uh, with the community and we'll be having a service of remembrance for Sarah starting at 7 p.m. in here at First Free Methodist Church. So we invite you to join us. Have a blessed day.